Welcome to Energy Stew. This is Peter Roth, your host. And I'd like to ask you, what do you know about your mental multidimensionality? How multidimensional are you? Maybe you are just unaware of living as a multidimensional being, but you can't help it. And we're going to understand that better because we're talking to a man who we've had on the show many times before. Um, actually, no, we haven't. We've had him on the show once before, but we're going to have him on the show many times again. <laughs> That's for sure. Because <laughs> he's, he's so terrific. And he really delves in this er area of our, let's call it, super beingness. And so uh, let's get started uh, talking with Dr. Melvin Morse. Melvin, thanks so much for being back on Energy Stew. I'm excited. This is, uh, I love being on your show because you explore topics that are so cutting edge and yet you bring it down to earth, you know, it is so well, it's sort of yeah. the far out uh, becomes uh, prosaic. I want to be logical about it all. Yeah. Not as, not as much purely scientific because if I was a traditional scientist, I would be a total naysayer <laughs> because you can't, I'm not sure. Well, well, you can only. I'm going to dispute that today because I am a traditional scientist. Right, you are. Um, I, I'm talking about as you listen. I'm talking about a different kind of traditional scientist. <laughs> That's true. The kind that don't want because to. we're at the edge of a paradigm shift. And so anytime that you have these, you know, there's been, uh, what, six, seven in Western civilization paradigm shifts uh, in the past, uh, you know, thousands of years. Um, and we're, we're at a paradigm shift now in which we've gone from a, uh, the materialistic scientific point of view, which says that, um, uh, you know, we're composed of uh, atoms, which then create molecules, which then created cells, which then create organisms, which create, have brains, and then that brain creates consciousness. Um, th that paradigm is the old paradigm. <laughs> the, the really, in the last 20, 30 years, the new paradigm is that consciousness comes first. And so that, uh, con and, and it doesn't, it's interesting, this new paradigm does not dispute the old paradigm. It simply says consciousness comes first, then consciousness generates what's called information theory. And information theory is the basis of cell phone technology, uh, almost all of uh, cutting edge uh, systems uh, theory, um, which is important in engineering sciences, et cetera. So uh, you, have you have information theory, then you have the laws of physics, and then those laws of physics determine atoms and molecules and, and well, cellular they structure. And but they exist yeah. already in these concepts. Exactly. <laughs> so uh, we were talking about a book, uh, An End to Upside Down Thinking, and uh, by uh, Goober, and I think that the, there's, that's just the first of many such books that's gonna come along to uh, explain the scientific revolution. Well, also, but there's no uh, question. Well, we are uh, multidimensional beings. Right, right. Uh, we and, know that from theoretical right. physics, we know it from neuroscience. And I recently recorded a show that's gonna air this week uh, with Christian De Quincey, who is a consciousness university professor <laughs> oh, wow I, I i've got to watch that myself that'll be very interesting yeah he, he's well, great and so um uh, you know i'm so happy to find all these like-minded people uh, as you are but i wanted to come back to what you were saying about consciousness and then information theory and what it, what it, i believe is that Consciousness starts off with just being pure consciousness, pure awareness, exactly. without thought, without information. It's not, it doesn't need information. Because we've gone, exactly. for instance, you and I and everybody else, we've gone through our whole lives being aware of, of each moment of our lives, 
it's the same being in awareness. I can go back, you know, anywhere in my life and see myself being aware of experiencing that moment in life. And there was also information. And, and so the, the, the energy around consciousness is what created the universe because the universe is information. It's all it is, yes. is information. To, to give our consciousness something to play with. <laughs> well, and, and this dovetails with what modern science is currently learning, but it also dovetails which we, what we learned uh, 2,500 years ago from uh, the Buddhist scholars, the Buddha himself, from Jewish sages that lived uh, in the Eastern Europe at that time. Um, you know, that, uh, for example, the Buddha described consciousness just as you did, that it's a luminous light that has no thought, but that all of consciousness is, is, is part of it. Now, so what do I mean by modern neuroscience? I don't think it's well understood that human beings have two streams of consciousness. And, and we know this amazingly enough from, uh, I was part of this when I was a medical student, they do split brain studies in which uh, for various reasons, uh, let's say intractable seizures, uh, they actually sever uh, a person's brain into its two parts. And then suddenly for the first time in their lives, uh, that hidden consciousness comes to light. So we have a verbal consciousness, or I love the way you put it, you know, the thought, you know, that sort of internal narrator, the chattering monkey, as some call it. That's clearly from the left brain. And then we have this uh, really non-thought, uh, non-linear, uh, unconscious, well, it's unconscious to us, uh, but it's a stream of consciousness that appears to be linked uh, with uh, this uh, universal uh, thoughtless consciousness. And what's you, interesting, uh, and we're just learning. Is, is what's interesting is that science has found that the more you repress the brain activity, the more consciousness expands. So even, you know, hallucinogens actually reduce brain activity. Near death experiences <laughs> are, are no brain activity, but even people in their right. dying states. And, and people who have been in comas, people you know, who are um, dement, demented, as, as they're about to die, all of a sudden they have expanded consciousness and, and they speak clearly and they have clear minds. And, and, and that's from reduced brain activity. So as they're Correct. dying, their so, brain so what, what, Right. So, you know, I used to, well, I was trained uh, to think that when the brain dies, then obviously consciousness died. You, but uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, you know, uh, from uh, my studies of uh, near-death experiences, as well as, uh, you know, dozens of others, that when the brain dies, consciousness expands. It actually becomes uh, beyond the human body. <laughs> and this dovetails nicely with recent research on uh, what does meditation do. And we now know that meditation follows um, precisely uh, what you've described, is that the first stage of meditation is an area called Brodman's area, which is in the back of the head, which integrates all of your five senses, and that area of the brain has to decrease activity. So you, you actually have to ha have less brain activity uh, that suppresses this Brodman's area, which is the ego-based, you know, five senses uh, view of the world. And only then do the other areas of the brain, which allow us to communicate with this universal consciousness, uh, come to life. Yeah, that's wonderful. So how do we go about getting there? <laughs> well, I've got a challenging question for you, though. I've been thinking a lot about this. My first question for you, Peter, is, should we go there? I mean, we're, we, we clearly are multidimensional beings. I mean, the, the, you know, the uh, theoretical physics tells us that there's 10 dimensions, perhaps. Uh, you know, I mean, it, it, they, they, they argue themselves over how many dimensions there are, but clearly there's more than just the three. Um, right. You know, they all agree on that. Um, right. So, but we're here 
it's seemingly for a specific reason. You know, those that have had near-death experiences that have interacted with this universal consciousness at the point of, of, you know, at the end of their lives, tell us that we're here for that specific reason to learn lessons of love. So maybe we're meant to stay in this three-dimensional, very restricted consciousness in order to learn our lessons. Well, I, I think that's in, the purpose of life. And what the, because uh, people suffer so much. And why do they suffer? And I always say, because in the suffering, you're seeking wholeness. You're seeking peace. You're seeking love through your suffering. And, and that brings you to more light. And that lights the universe. And so the purpose yeah. of life is to light the universe more through the hard road that we're, you know, it's like creating pearls in an oyster shell. And so uh, we could say, okay, that's, but how much of it do we need? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, so I just, I just wanted to pose that question. I'll, I'll give you an analogy that I often think of is uh, I used to work uh, in the uh, infant intensive care unit where we had the infants in uh, these little incubators. And there'd always be one infant that didn't want to stay in its incubator. That, that every time the, the nurses opened the little portholes, you know, to feed them or, you know, change dressings or whatever, those infants would, would, would make a break for it and try to get out. <laughs> and I, I, I wonder to myself, you know, are we being that foolish? <laughs> you know, or are we like those infants? That we, you know, we're meant to stay in this three-dimensional restricted universe. Uh, you know, because obviously if those infants uh, did in fact escape, uh, they would be uh, endangering themselves and they wouldn't be able to develop properly. But that's so, an important. So, so uh, that's very important. Yeah, our suffering is for a reason. Right, but let's look at the NDEs. Let's look at these, you know, thousands of people, millions of people likely, have had NDEs and have seen the light, have been in blissful environments and come back. Because otherwise it wouldn't yes. be a DE, it would be a DE. And, and right. so, <laughs> so why do they choose to come back? And fortunately for them, they've had the experience of the other side. So when they come back, their memory usually is intact enough to tackle the, the struggle of this dimension with more clarity and optimism because they've seen the light. Because as we are born, there's a veil that uh, we forget where we've come from and we're in the suffering and it just looks terrible and we don't know what to do about it. But when you've seen the other side and you come back, you know, you, know, you're, you have a higher uh, aspect about it. Well, I, I, I want to uh, expand on that then, you know, or you know, piggyback on that because, uh, uh, you know, I, I do want to come back to that many people don't want to come back. But let, you know, when, when, People come back from their near-death experience, invariably, it's for love. They feel that there's something unfinished. Um, one girl told me uh, that um, she was to have a brother who was born with heart disease, so she had to help uh, her uh, mother. But one of, the most, um, one of the cases that taught me the most was this young man who told me uh, that he, was, uh, he had a near-death experience, nearly drowning. Uh, when he was about 10, and he told me that uh, a voice told him, go back, Bobby, you have a job to do. So this was earlier in my, uh, you know, in, in my studies, and, you know, I was sort of full of myself and a little bit skeptical about all this, and I interviewed him as part of a study of the long-term, uh, you know, what happens to you over the long term of having a near-death experience. So I interviewed him when he was in his 20s. And so I was like, oh gosh, you know, so he has a job to do, you know, the cure for cancer or something like that. And he saw the look on my face and he said, I already told you what my job is. I run a small construction company. And, uh, you know, those numb nuts wouldn't know what to do with me if, if they didn't have me uh, to, uh, you know, to employ them. <laughs> and, Everybody has you know, a path. He, 
Right. He came back from his near-death experience to run a small construction company. Yeah. So that tells us something very important, you know, that we're meant to live the life that we live. And, it, you know, it's not, they don't come back for grandiose reasons. They right. come back for very simple reasons. But I, I work with the, people, the ordinary life we live. I work with a lot of people who struggle and don't feel that they're living the life that they were supposed to live, that they're not on purpose because they're working so hard with their struggles. And I look at them and I go, guess what? This is it. <laughs> this is the life you've come here for. Maybe there's more right. to it after you're done with what you're doing now. But right now, just embrace that this is part of what you came for. Right. Uh, you know, I have learned that the hard way that uh, virtually whatever it is that we're dealing with is what we're meant to deal with. Now, that's not to say that then that gives us some sort of free pass. That, that just gives us encouragement, you know, to right. know that we've got to struggle through at those times when it just feels overwhelming. When, right. when the stuff, you know, it is, it is true. That, uh, I mean, excuse me, it's not true that uh, God uh, gives uh, you only what you can handle. Some people uh, get things that they can't handle. And I think that uh, I, at least I personally have been able to share with them what I know about the near-death experience, which teaches us that we're here to learn lessons of love, to be able to then encourage them. And, you know, just as it sounds like you have in your work, where you, where you have to say, no, wait a moment, this is your struggle. This is what you're here to learn. Right. As, as limited as it might feel. <laughs> well, yeah, that's, you know, that's, so that brings up another question then, is how do we know when the universe is talking to us? You know, how do we know when our multidimensional consciousness is in sync? You know, when, when do we know that a word of encouragement is coming to us versus something that's generated by our own ego that's a response to fears or anxieties um you know how how, how can we sense that well i and, you know I, like I feel that everything is in divine order even our egos and the suffering that our egos create for us <laughs> is all right that's a really interesting way to look at it that's a really interesting way to look at it because i've always tried to differentiate you know what what thoughts are coming from my own ego, you know, the, and, and then what is actually a, a sign from the universe, if you will. <laughs> and, but what you're saying is that maybe that, that's, uh, you know, maybe I'm, uh, I don't need to make such a fine distinction between the right. two. Right. And I've, I've had many times in my life where my ego seemed to be running things, causing trouble. And I've had a mm -hmm. lot of, a lot of, parts of my life that really were lousy because I wasn't thinking straight. It was like that ego was pushing me. And, and I look back on it all and I'm, I'm grateful for all of it. You know, at, at this age and, I, and there was, you know, so much pain, but it brought me to who I am and what I know and, you know, I've gained so much wisdom from the journey that I was on. And I tell that to people all the time, you're on a wisdom journey. You know, you're, you might be bumping along hard bumps, but look at the wisdom it's created. So in other words, we shouldn't regret uh, our mistakes, but we should embrace them and learn from them and see them as part because I'm always trying, well, I don't think it's just me. I, I think that many of us are, are looking to sort of a higher power to guide us. But uh, what I'm understanding you to say is, is maybe, maybe a higher power is just to support us, uh, to help us. I love that. Uh, but, yeah. you know, but, you know, but uh, that uh, we do need to uh, be uh, more aware of our, our suffering right. and the suffering of others. Right. I think that to understand the suffering of others uh, is so important uh, in order it is a, as a way of growing your character and again, becoming part of 
a multidimensional being? Well, I, I believe that when we come into life, we're, we're shown a basic understanding of the life we're coming into. And we know, okay, I'm going to be dealing with this and that. Oh, that's going to be terrible. But look where I am now. Where I'm coming from is this beautiful other higher dimensional universe that I'm going to come back to. So maybe I can deal with it. <laughs> maybe I'll get into this and learn the hard lessons that my soul will benefit from and the universe will benefit from. And I'll step into this life and have these terrible things happen. And and it'll that search, that purpose of trying to find light and love in every hardship will be so much stronger. And I think souls are so brave to come into this world and do this. Well, it's in times of suffering that we find God. There, there's no right. question about that. Right. That, uh, you know, when I look around, uh, I think it's in the, the most difficult and extreme situations. And often it's, we find God in the wrong places. We find God in, in, in the so-called refuge of, of society, you know, the criminals, the, you know, our so-called you know, criminals, uh, the, the, you know, the, the, the impoverished, the uh, people who are challenged in so many different ways. Interestingly enough, that's where I find God. Uh, in uh, my interactions with those people. Right, and maybe the, the strongest way to find God is to have a near-death experience. And that's about as harsh as it can, as it can be that you... <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I think that um, through meditation, you can find the same types of uh, understandings. Uh, I, I'm you know, they're not as profound, you know, obviously, right. because right. near-death experience wipes away your ego completely. But uh, the process of uh, meditation, in which, as you say, turns off uh, the ego-driven areas of the brain, uh, can sometimes allow us to then enter into that uh, luminous universe. Um, yes, but it's temporary. You know, right. And, and it's temporary. And it's something, I think, that takes practice. Uh, right. You know, the, oftentimes the people, uh, you know, the, the, when in meditation, they'll, they'll, well, I can't meditate, I can't sit there for so long, or etc. There's many different ways to meditate. Uh, there's a movement-oriented uh, um, meditation. Uh, really, meditation goes back to what you said originally, Peter, which is it's simply to be in the now. So oftentimes, meditation is just paying attention. You know, taking a walk in the woods, sure. careful contemplation, you know, see, right? Contemplation. But, you know, I see the green leaf. I see the pattern and textures of the bark. Um, you right. know, th those types of active meditation uh, techniques, I think, work best for modern man. Anyway, you, you know, the traditional meditation was, of course, developed at a time. Uh, where there weren't cell phones, there weren't uh, the stresses that we have in our ordinary lives, there weren't the constant noise in the background, uh, etc. So, you know, we need uh, new meditation techniques uh, for the 21st century. Well, I, I interviewed a man who went up into the Himalayas and meditated in a cave for three months, and he would go into 15 hours of bliss at a time. But when he was done, he'd have to go out of the cave to go get food in, in the local village and deal with all the hardships of, of life in the Himalayas. And he realized that, wait a minute, you know, these 15 hours of bliss were beautiful. I loved it. But then here I am back in reality of crazy people doing <laughs> crazy things. Uh, that reminds me of a Jewish uh, story uh, in which uh, a, a seeker, uh, you know, seeks out a rabbi uh, who is uh, meditating, uh, you know, uh, in, in a cave in the wilderness. And uh, the seeker says uh, to him, uh, you, know, you know, what is the meaning of life? <laughs> and then the answer is, what? <laughs> Why are you asking me? Go down to the marketplace. You know, go down to the Go down to the woman who has to, uh, you know, to, to, to struggle to survive and keep her family going. You know, that's where uh, you should go to find the meaning of life. You know, I, I'm just simply uh, here, uh, you know. Meditating. 
blowing my consciousness. Right. But I wanted to. Uh, I, I wanted we only to. only have you know, a minute or two left, by the way. Oh, okay. Well, I, I got to tell you real quick then. Um, the modern game Tetris, which is a video game, has uh, been shown from scientific studies to be just as powerful as meditation. Wow. Uh, you know, the typical type of meditation that you're describing. Even um, going on to, for example, healing post-traumatic stress disorder uh, and triggering a variety of different types of psychological healings uh, from playing the video game Tetris. And this is published in the magazine Science. That's what so, yeah. know about. Thank you. And so let's um, tell our audience where they can find out more information about you and, and your work. My website is Melvin Morse MD, so that's just M E L V I N M O R S E M D dot com. And please, uh, I love uh, to talk to people. I'm still doing a lot of uh, near death research, I have a particular interest in remote viewing. So uh, come to my website, uh, drop me an email, uh, and uh, we can continue this dialogue. Uh, or uh, continue to listen to Peter's show. <laughs> yeah, we're going to have more. This is so much fun to talk with you, and I'd yeah. love to explore these areas of, of uh, understanding that you've been able to appreciate in your life. And <laughs> so, uh, Melvin, thanks so much for being at Energy Stew. It's such a pleasure. Oh, it's just so, it's so wonderful to be able to, you know, so often we live such, you know, constricted lives and we can't really explore all of this. And this is just a wonderful opportunity for me to, to you know, to just, uh, you know, have fun with these uh, ideas, uh, which uh, otherwise from the scientific point of view, you know, have to be carefully documented and, you know, et cetera. Right, and right. So we enjoyed the exploration. Right. So thank right. you so much. And Thank you so much. And this is Peter Roth, your host of Energy Stew at PRN.FM. I can be reached at Peter at Heart River, H-E-A-R-T River.org. I'd love to hear from you, and thanks so much for listening.